It's the nation's favourite antiques expert. Yeah! Super cool. How about that? Behind the wheel of a classic car. <laughs> and a goal to scar Britain for antiques. <laughs> The aim? To make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. There'll be worthy winners... Yes! ..and valiant losers. Blast it! Will it be the high road to glory... <laughs> ..or the slow road to disaster? <laughs> this is the Antiques Road Trip. Nice! Look at that. Wow. Settle down in the back, kiddos. <laughs> because we've got another electrifying adventure ahead, courtesy of seasoned road trippers, Anita Manning and Paul Laidlaw. Look at this view. I could drink this in all day in here. Yep, we're on the fourth leg of the journey and are cruising through the glorious Lake District in an open-top Triumph TR6 and a drone. A uh hundred -huh. door for you. Yeah. You're on your desert island wilderness. Right. Three luxuries does the city give a Nia Manning day with it? Oh, has to be lipstick. <laughs> That's essential. <laughs> You've got to look your best. <laughs> For standards, darling. <laughs> and a mirror. <laughs> I love this game. Anything else? A suitable bonnet. <laughs> <laughs> Can't it's be without a bonnet. <laughs> Great choice. Last time, Anita won the battle at auction and has £229.38 in her piggy bank. However, Paul has £332.98 to splash this time. So what about you, Paul? What would uh, your choices be? A, a library, B, a wine cellar, and C, Swiss Army knife. Give me a week. I'd build myself a little mansion. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Anita and Paul's journey started from Doon in the Trossachs. Great word, that. They've caroused around southern Scotland and will coast through England's northern counties before heading to a final auction in Newcastle upon Tyne. On this trip, we're pointed to an auction in Bolton, but we start our shopping in Kirby Lonsdale. A pretty market town. It's packed with independent shops. Like this one. Dale's Antiques. Paul's already been dropped off. The shopkeepers here are Leonard and Doris, one of whom is barking. Ah, remember, Anita has about £230 in her sporran, and there's plenty to tempt her to spend in here. Do girls have sporrans? What can seduce her in the cabinet? This, perhaps. Tell me about this, Leonard. That's a pastry roller. It would go round the edge of a pastry or cut the pastry, and it'll give it a little, little uh, serrated pattern, that pattern there. Quite a nice little bit of tree. Uh-huh. Trina objects fashioned from wood. This is 19th century and 15 pounds, and is actually a cutter or a crimper for pastry. It's, it's just a, a sort of simple wee thing, it's but... very simple, uh, simple but effective. <laughs> OK. I'll maybe have a wee think about that. OK. You know, I mean, it's, yes. it's still a, it's a sweet. nice wee thing, isn't <laughs> it? It is. Yeah, like Doris. That's a possible. Let's catch up with Paul. He's jumped the county line and is in North Yorkshire and Ingleton to visit Lords Antiques and Salvage. Fancy. It's rather vast and has about 60 dealers under its roof. Thankfully, Dean and Breton are on hand to help. But where will Paul start? Antiques? Salvage? Or this? Looks a bit, um, modern. What on earth is Laidlaw doing, is what you're thinking. Because that is near contemporary. It is. John Bellany was one of a group of post-war artists that uh, brought a bit of renaissance in art in Scotland. The figure on the left in profile may be the artist. The figure is holding a saxophone and wearing what looks like a bird's head decoration. This beguiles me. This is fascinating art. But for now, I'll leave it at that and see if Breton is about the price. 
Yes, it's ticketed at £165, but Paul can't haggle if he can't find the dealer. Is that the toilets that way? No, it must be this way. That's the problem with these big shops. Should have left a wee trail of bread. <laughs> oh, dear. Now he's lost the picture. Or is it the plot? Is it that one down there? Mm, yeah. Yes, yes, it is. Thank goodness. I'm surprised myself here, Breton. A John Bellany etching. I want this, but I don't know at what price I do, and it's not at 165. Um, any chance of you contacting the gallery owner and getting me the, the bottom line on it? I'll see what I can do. Great stuff. My breath is baited. My fingers are crossed. Uh-oh, Breton's back. I tried twisting his arm a bit, and Good he man. said the uh, best he'll do on it is 140. Let me think about that. I'll come and find you in a moment. Decisions, decisions. There's a name as part of this work, and the name is Aurora. That's the name of my daughter. I'm buying the picture. <laughs> that is sold. Wish me luck. Good luck. Go put it aside. Now, how's Anita getting on in Kirby Lonsdale? Oh! She spotted something. It's in a cabinet. It'll be shiny. In this shop full of wonderful antiques, I've found two small modest items. One is the lapis pendant, and the other is a little pastry. Pastry rubber. Uh-huh. That pendant's pretty. Do you know, I love lapis lazuli, and I love the name. Lapis Lazuli. Lapis Lazuli is a semi-precious bright blue stone famously used around the striking eyes of Tutankhamun's mask, amongst other places. We're at 15 on both. If I bought both of them, is there any discount on that? I'd do 25. 25. Could you do uh, 24? Yes, I could do 24. Right, OK. So, 24, 24. that's lovely. Thank How you. does that sound to you, Doris? Doris says, I'll get me tea tonight. Uh -huh. Oh, Doris! She's such a cutie! That's £12 a piece and Anita has her first two buys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Doris. Back in Ingleton, Paul's still on the prowl. label says silver ladles, funnily enough, but it's the silver bit that's the revelation, particularly in combination with a £20 price tag. They're antique silver. This is all hand wrought, ladies and gentlemen. George III, so they are 200, maybe 250 years old. And I found the reason for the £20 price tag. The marks are very rubbed. Very rubbed indeed, to the point of near illegibility. Never mind near, illegibility. I adore these. OK, Paul, to buy or not to buy? No surprises. They are sold. Step this way. What? There's more? Now, round here, I spied something. I tried to rally it on. Here it is. Ha! A pearl necklace. How glamorous. One way to gauge the quality of the pearls is to look at the clasp. Now, if it is plated brass, maybe your pearls aren't so good. However, if they are... ..18-carat gold... <laughs> <laughs> That's better. I think these are very wearable. I do like a lady wearing good pearls. Ticket price, £40. Going to take a punt? I am going to try and do some work on that price tag. And the only way to do that is to find Breton. What would we do without Breton, eh? How you doing, fellas? Hi. I've not acted the goat with those. That's the silver ladle sold for £20, then. But I am going to be awkward with these. I'd like to be half that in the real world. OK, 
Can you make a call? Well, we can try. We can try it. Go then. for it. That's all you can do. Breton, get back on the blower. Right. The dealers agreed to come down from £40 to £25 for the pearl necklace. That's a total of £185, including those silver ladles and the John Bellany print. And the fine art under the arm. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. All the best. Cheers. See you later. And Paul's bagged three items in his first shop. Ooh! A car boot on Sunday. That's in my diary. Now, let's find our leading lady. Anita's next pit stop is Windermere. Lucky girl. Sitting on the edge of its namesake's spectacular lake, the town is home to Courtyard Cottage Antiques, which has a cornucopia of collectibles and is owned by Jean. Anita has just over £200 and a beady eye, so what will she spot? Oh, hello. Looks like Jean's got something. Oh, isn't it lovely? This looks interesting. Warrants a closer look. A child's walking stick. Child's walking no, stick. No, you don't see them very often, do you? You don't. Are these uh, silver mounted, yeah? Yes, they are. But it's the scale of the thing. Yeah. Which is Lovely, so nice. Yeah. We saw. I wonder if that was ever used by a child and what was the story behind it. I know. It's most unusual. Mm. Definitely out of the ordinary. And £58. Thoughts, Anita? Can we leave that there? Yeah, of course we can. A potential buy. Excellent. Anything else? Could I have a look at that one there? A mid-century watch. You can. See that one there? Yes. That gold one? Yes. OK. Case is gold, but I don't think the strap is. No. It's probably just a, a scrapper, but it's got that 1950s look, look about, about it. Yeah. Yeah. Ticket price, £45. I'll tell you what I'd like to pay on it. 20, 25 pounds. Could we go 30? Will we go 30? Mm -hmm. For the knackered watch? For the knackered watch. <laughs> Let's go 30 for the knackered watch. <laughs> Good stuff. Now, what about the child's walking stick? Can it be anywhere near 30? 35. 35. We'll go for it. Yeah. 35. That's great. Thank you very much. I'm happy. Good. You're happy? Jean's happy. And I'm ecstatic! Two more purchases. Just over £140 left to spend, and Anita's finished her shopping for today. Way! Thank it's you. It's been great being Thank here. You very Thank much. you. Bye bye. I think a treat is in order, don't you? <laughs> quack, quack, quack. Oh dear. Nice one, Ducky. Meanwhile, our other mischief maker has made his way to the hamlet of Plum Garths near Kendall. And he has sausages, not ice cream on his mind. The humble sausage is said to be as old as civilization itself, with ancient Babylonians and Greeks all enjoying the meaty treat. Around the world, different flavours suit local tastes, and in Britain alone, there are over 400 varieties. Here in South Cumbria, one is a particular favourite, the Cumberland. And the story of how it became curly and spicy is as interesting as it is tasty. Butcher Steve Chambers is in the know. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well, Paul. How are you? Do you know what? I should be elsewhere, but <laughs> I cannot resist. A sausage there. May Th I? There's something, yeah. Yeah, oh. by all means. Got my name yeah. on it. Do Come try. On. Do try. Oh. Yeah. You've called it a very good time, then. Yeah. I've not met anyone that didn't like our sausage, though. Obviously. We believe the British do it best. So. <laughs> <laughs> Germans would have something to say about yeah, that. Yeah, I'm sure they would. I'm sure they would. <laughs> and we can debate that over some sausages and a beer. Yes. <laughs> In fact, the Cumberland 
could have Germany to thank for its unusual shape. In the 1600s, an influx of Germans to Cumbria brought their expertise to the metal, mineral and coal mining industries here. And they also brought their penchant for a coiled, meaty sausage. But the famous flavour can be traced back to the nearby port of Whitehaven in the 18th century. Cumberland sausage, as you've just tasted, is, is a really spicy sausage. It's, a, it, it's rich in, in, in lots of different ingredients. Whitehaven was a, the third largest port in the UK at, at one, one time. Uh, ships were in and out of there all the time, and they bring, used to bring spices, so uh, from the Caribbean, uh, from India, and, and Whitehaven became really famous as a, as a spice port. We're sure that some of that ended up in, in the sausage. The sausage used to be made from the very fatty but now extinct Cumberland pig. But tastes have changed to use leaner pork now. Time to meet butcher's assistant Rosie. Rosie? Rosie, would you like to, uh, to show us some mincing? Harking back to centuries ago, it's coarsely minced to retain a chunky texture. And when it comes to the traditional spice blend of nutmeg, pepper, mace and sage, Steve, like other local butchers, adds his own secret twist. Nice hair, Matt. Oh, that is heady. These are expensive ingredients hundreds of years ago. Oh, yes. This is the exotic stuff, the pepper, that's more oh. expensive pound for pound than gold. Well, this has come halfway around the world, hasn't it? So how gonna... much of that goes in there? I mean, is it teaspoons or handfuls? Yeah, Rosie, I'll just use a spoon. And again, the quantity is, is a secret, so if you could just turn it... It's not called a secret recipe for nothing, Paul. So, we're now going to move that across to the, the, the sausage machine. A sausage <laughs> machine? Such fun. Naturally, our have-a-go heroes at the ready. Is it a difficult thing to do, Rosie? Yeah, it's quite difficult, it's quite fast. <laughs> I'm sure you'll get the hang of it. Let's see, shall we? The sausage skin is made of pig intestine to follow tradition. Now it's the exciting bit. We're going to fire pork out of the vacuum vessel into that skin and that is going to create your, your, your traditional Cumberland sausage. This is the part of the process that I really struggle with and this is where the skill factor comes in. So, good luck, Paul. <laughs> Right, you ready to go? Ready no, not go. at all, but let's, <laughs> let's try. <laughs> oh, oh, geez. Oh, oh, geez. I bet this was a messy job before sausage machines. What, what? Who knew it would be so tricky? Look at that, that's like a gorilla's finger, for goodness sake. That's got to be thick enough. Is that thick enough? Not quite. No <laughs> thicker! <laughs> I'm speechless. Look at that, a masterpiece, for goodness sake. <laughs> Where's the pan? <laughs> Well, that, well, that's my serving. So that Does anyone that? else want some? Look at that. Cracking job, Paul. Time for a tasty test. Okay. There we go, Paul. I could get used to Look this. Look at that. And this is the life. All your own handiwork. <laughs> right, tuck in. Right, OK, let's have a taste. Here we go. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> well done, that oh. man. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Brilliant. Mm. Belly is full. Time to get back on the road. It's been a busy, busy old day. How are the old pals in the Triumph? We had a great day and enjoyed it thoroughly. What about you? you? Let's do a nap. <laughs> a nap. Nighty night. Good morning. All set for more jolly japes in the lakes? Great. Let's catch the chat in the triumph. You still see faces in cars. As a kid, I saw fa proper faces in cars. All right. <laughs> well, when I was wee, there weren't that many cars in the road. <laughs> <laughs> cars with faces? I've heard it all now. Yesterday, Paul bought a pearl necklace, two silver sauce ladles and a John Bellany print. Which one? He still has £147.98 left in his wallet. Anita, meanwhile, bought a child's walking stick, a gold watch, a pastry cutter crimper and a pendant. I love lapis lazuli. 
she has £140.38 left to spend. Well, this is happiness. Isn't it just? <laughs> oh, I'm feeling all loved up. Right, back to work. And with Anita safely dropped off, Paul's headed solo to the first shop of the day in Cartmel. Centuries old and unspoilt, it dates right back to 677. Paul has just under £150 to spend in Cartmel Village Vintage. But what will catch his eye? Here's one that talks to me. This is an L wand. What's an L, Laidlaw? Well, an L is an ancient form of measurement. Its origins are in the BC with the cubit. A cubit, I believe, was a measurement from a typical adult elbow to end of digit. That's a cubit, and a cubit is related to the L, E-L-L. -L. This is an L wand for measuring your Ls. The L wand was used for measuring everything from cloth to cricket pitches. Legend has it Edward I insisted every town in his kingdom had one. And it tells us here in English, L is a yard and a quarter, which is 45 inches. A Scottish L is 37 inches. There might be a name there, I see a Gothic M. It is dated 1831 and that I really like. I adore it. This truly is a joy for the collector of treen or measuring instruments. £20. And I think that measures up rather well. So I'm going to buy it. Bye. Good stuff. Go find the dealer. Denise. Paul. One L wand treen measuring stick. Beautiful. And I've got to be honest with you, a £20 price tag is equally charming. That's £20. Do okay, well with it. This is an L wand, and this is me saying goodbye. Fantastic. Paul has four lots and still has just shy of £130 left in his wallet. <laughs> what? Someone needs a sugar boost. <laughs> yeah. Now, remember, Laidlaw, not a word. <laughs> Anita. It was sheer hell this morning and I struggled to find a single thing to buy. Yeah. Your secret's mm. safe with me, Albine. If you save some for me, though. Mm. <laughs> Meanwhile, Anita has made her way to the market town of Ulverston. She's here to find out how a period of religious and national unrest 400 years ago led to hostility and imprisonment for some. Ah, Jane, lovely to meet and you. Nice to meet you. Ah, what a wonderful situation. Jane Pearson is here to tell Anita about a chapter of Alberston's past. Take us back to the 17th century. It was a time of great turmoil, wasn't it? It was because, of course, we'd broken away from the Roman Catholic Church. The country had been in civil war and we'd beheaded a king. It was a dark time to be alive. And people really were beginning to wonder whether it was God's judgment in some way uh, that those things had happened. Yeah. So these times were ripe for new ideas. They were. Step forward, George Fox, a Protestant dissenter. He decided to create a new way to worship. Central to his grand idea for a new religion was the nearby Swarthmore Hall, where today Jane is manager. Tell me about George Fox's early life. He was an unusual young man. He was deeply religious. He knew his Bible intimately. And like lots of young people, he had questions, but his were of a spiritual nature. Mm -hmm. And when he couldn't find any answers, he had a personal crisis. In the middle of that crisis, he felt he heard God speak to him. A revelation. A revelation. George believed that you didn't need a priest, church, or other religious trapping to have a direct experience with God. You could worship in your own home or anywhere you chose. He began to travel far and wide, 
to spread his revolutionary ideas, but his base was to become Alverston. Enthralled by his mission, owner Margaret Fell welcomed him to Swarthmore Hall. Mind the stop. This is an amazing building. When does it date from, Jane? It's actually late Elizabethan. Right. So we think it dates from about 1586. But this part of the hall is very much as it might have been in the 17th century. At that time when George lived here? Exactly. In the early days of the movement, George slowly started to gain a following. So just watch your head and when you come in. <laughs> but his teachings weren't welcomed by the establishment. He was really viewed as blasphemous and what he was doing as a crime. You know, he was in, imprisoned for his beliefs. He said to the judge that he should tremble at the word of the Lord. And the judge mocked him and said, you're a Quaker and that name has stuck. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how the name started? That's how the name started. That's interesting. In fact, George was imprisoned several times, but continued between sentences to travel as far as the Americas to spread his newly monikered Quaker movement with fervor. Margaret Fell also became a driving force. A strong advocate of the movement's core values of truth, simplicity, peace and equality, she also spent many years in prison for her beliefs. But it didn't hold her back. She wrote copious letters, epistles, including talking about the freedom of women to speak as ministers. So she was definitely an advocate for equality for men and for women. Mm -hmm. A very modern woman. A very modern woman. In 1669, Margaret and George Fox married, but most of their marriage was spent separated by spells in prison and their far-reaching evangelism. Swarthmore Hall, however, had become the Quakers' headquarters. This is where early Quakers met. What sort of form did the meetings take? They came together in silence, and out of that stillness, they would feel sometimes moved to minister, and that could be a man or a woman. Eventually, the movement began to gain respect, and towards the end of the 17th century, an act of tolerance was passed to allow Quakers, also known as Friends, the freedom to worship. There were many notable Quakers in business and industry. Absolutely. Well, in a way, they had no choice because they were banned from going into the professions. So they established businesses, but very much on Quaker principles. So think of some of the big chocolate producers, Cadbury's, Fry's, Roundtree's, Clark's Shoes. These were Quaker enterprises. And they were the first church really to establish an anti-slavery movement in Britain. And even kind of right up to the present day, it was the first British church to uh, speak in favor of same-sex marriages. Jane, thank you very much. It's been fascinating learning all about the Quakers. Paul, meanwhile, is destined for the small hamlet of Low Newton and Yew Tree Barn, which dates back to the 19th century. With an eclectic mix of antiques and reclamation, who knows what will leap out? What will he spend his 130 or so pounds on? What is he playing at? Mind blown. <laughs> Over a skipping rope? These are Flexton trademark skipping rope handles. Look at the ends. That is a ball race. These are ball bearings. Because your cord freely rotates within that ball race and handle forever. It, this rope never twists and kinks and knots. Oh my goodness, look at this. Now, I was no good at skipping. I had defective kit. This explains everything. I love these. Cries out 1950s, does it not? How nostalgic. 10 pounds will get you this feat of engineering, Paul. 
You tempted? I'm skipping off to buy these. Hop to it, then. <laughs> now, Anita was supposed to be shopping here, too. Oh, Lord. <laughs> She's arrived, then. I'll catch up in Laidlaw somehow. Come on, you rascal. What else can you find for your £140? The winner! Best not jump the gun, Manning. Has Paul settled on the skipping rope? James. Hi. Skipping ropes. And, do you know what? For £10, I don't think they're expensive. Good. We'll take those. Very kind of you. Bit of fun. Good. So, give you that. Thank you. And, of course, I shall skip off. Thanks, James. Bye. That's Paul finishing his shopping. Couldn't be happier. Ooh, looky here. We have been driving in one of the most beautiful areas in the UK. But I think a very important thing to have in this area is a good pair of binoculars. Now, I quite like the markings. Snooth of Kendall. They're made in Japan. These are late 20th century. And Snaith is the local retailer, not the manufacturer. They are in a gorgeous pigskin case. These are marked up at £28. <laughs> That's not a lot. But I would like it better if I could get a nice wee chunk off of it. Every little helps, Anita. I thought I heard a wee mouse squeaking. It was probably ladle or creeping about. Yeah, I can see Paul Laidlaw in the distance up to no good. Yeah. You yes? You struggling? Nope. Plain sailing in this corner. Plain sailing. Listen, I've got my eyes on you. I think these two are regressing. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, shopping. James, I like these. They're priced up at £28. Could I buy them for in the region of £20? I think it's a little low, but if we met in the middle and said £24, I think that's a nice drop. Would that help? Of course. I'm delighted with that. That's great. Brilliant. Uh, that 20. deal on those binos concludes the shopping for this trip. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Which can only mean one thing. Goodbye, Lake District. It's almost time for an auction. <laughs> well, there's another day down. <laughs> I'm thinking supper, though. And you're always thinking of filling your face. <laughs> My metabolism. I'm like a machine. <laughs> I need a well drink. Oh, bump! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Time for some shut-eye, then. Morning, and welcome to Bolton, the country's biggest town. Over a quarter of a million people call it home. And fingers crossed, they all know it's auction day in the former Metropolitan Library. Well, Paul, our penultimate auction. And how are you feeling about this uh, offering? Well, I'm what looking forward to going in. I enjoy this auction. I'm hoping our stuff does well, because we've both got nice things. We have. Yeah, they have. All picked up on their travels in and around the southern lakes. A short jaunt down the M6 sees our trippers in Lancashire and Bolton, hoping to sell their finds to this crowd at Bolton Auction Rooms and the rest of the world on the internet. Anita spent £113 on five lots, including that rather mawkish child's stick. Paul, what do you say? I think Anita has genuinely found something somewhat poignant. Yeah. I think a child needing a cane. Palm wood, silver, rarity, results. I think this is going to generate a profit. I'm impressed. So am I. Paul himself spent £215, also on five lots. Pearl's going in and out of fashion, and today, pearls are hot. The market loves pearls. £25, there's more than that in weight in gold. 
in the class. So this was a good buy for that price. Auctioneer Harry Howcroft has been in the biz for over 30 years. Thoughts, Harry? Uh, the case binocular is very nice, in good order, uh, always popular in our sale room, and we should get a decent price for them. The pair of silver early ladles, they are possibly George III. Uh, we do always have interest in the silver, and we should be OK to get them away at a good price. Right. Gather round, people. Take your seats. <laughs> it's time to get selling. Plenty of buyers. <laughs> <laughs> That's what uh, I like. First out of the hammer, Anita's pastry crimper cutter. Here we go, okay, yeah. Thank you, darling. Century, uh, straight in at £10 bid. Uh, £10 bid on the net, 12 anywhere. I've got 12, 14. Uh, 14 bid, 16, is it? Uh, £16 pound bid, 18, is it? Can you live without it? Come on. <laughs> uh, 18, uh, 16 pound bid. All done at 16 pounds, 18 new bidder. Yes. 18 pound bid. Do you go 20? It's a new world record for a pastry chicken. Ladies bid of 22 pounds. Anita kicks off with a profit. Marvellous. That is a new world record. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's first lot now is L wand. Here we go. Up uh, 28 pound bed at 28 pound bed. Sitting in. Up at 30. Yes. Up at 30 in the room, 35 anywhere. Yeah. Don't think bed, it's expensive. 35, 40, 40 back in the room at 40 pound bed. Up uh, 40 pound bed at 45. Up uh, 40 pound bed. Ladies bed then in the room at 40 pound. pound. <laughs> Last call then, the gobble's up at 40. A real measure of success. Well done. Well, that's our first item. Uh, now. And Four both of them doing well. healthy. Anita's pendant is next with the lapis lazuli stone. Uh, I do have interest at 16 on the bed. Uh, 16 on the bed, I'll take 18, 18 pound, 20, 22, 24, 26 pound bed. 28, 30, 35, 40, 45, 45 pound bed. It's a flyer. Fine. Oof. Uh, fit pound bed, back with a lady. Uh, fit pound bed, I'll take 55 anywhere. Uh, fit pound bed. Somebody did treat themselves. At 50 pounds. We all done the gobbles up then at 50. Yes, great result. Well done. Some ladies <laughs> treated herself <laughs> because <laughs> she deserves it. <laughs> Paul's vintage plaything now, a 50s skipping rope. Hey ho, oh, skip to my loo, my darling. <laughs> <laughs> I've got 10, 12 pound at 12 pound bed. Look at that. 12 pound bed. 14, 16, 18, 18, 20. Look at my they're showing great four, wisdom and judgment. 26, 28, uh, 26 pound bed. Uh, 26 pound bed, that's bed. 26 pounds in the room at 26. Decent profit and not to be sniffed at. I still think if they'd have stressed the engineering of them, I'd have got to oh, very oh. <laughs> Next up, Anita's gold watch. Oh, oh, in oh, oh, gold. Here we go. Uh, I've got a little bit of interest with me at 28 pound bid at 28 pound bid, I'll say 30. 30, 5, 40. Uh, 40 pound bid is in the room. Uh, could go another one, I could, could stick there. In at 50. No, a uh, 45 pound bid. On the net at 45, I'll take 50 anywhere. We all done and finished at 45 pounds. A uh, 50 pound bid, 55 anywhere. We all done last call then. The gobbles were at 50 pounds. Timely profit. Fantastic. That's the right price for yeah, it. That's the right price. Next under the gavel, it's Paul's pearl necklace. Classy. Uh, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30 pound bid. It's uh, rushing. 35, 40, I'll take. Uh, 35, I'll take 40. Uh, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, it's good value for me, uh, it's good value for uh, someone else. Never a truer word said, Paul. In our sights now, Anita's binoculars. 
bidding covenants at 16 only bid at 18 pound bid at 20 pound bid uh, 20 pound bid at 22 bid uh, 22 pound tw in the room advantage okay, come uh, 24 24 26 uh, 24 pound bid on the net at 26 new bid at 26 28 up to 28 30 uh, 30 pound bid up to 35 oh uh, he's even happier at 35 this is in the room at 30 pound bid at 30 well, you can't complain about that. Good job. I might Six see days. you in front of me, not behind me now. Stranger things have happened. Paul Silver Ladles are up for grabs next, over 200 years old. I am crossing everything right now. Oh, Here we go. Nice. 40 pound bed at 40 pound bed. Double, oh, 40 double, pound double, 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 uh, 40 pound bed. Uh, 45 pound bed on the net. Uh, 45 pound bed. I'll take 50 anywhere. Uh, 45 out. pound bed. I'll take 50 anywhere. On the net then at 45 pound. A wee bit more than that. Last call then at 45. That is four out of four profits for Paul. Well done. It's another profit. Uh, well, no enough, you've but... doubled your money. He did, but can Anita repeat Paul's success with the child's walking stick? Hello, Here we six. go. All right, then. I do have a little bit of interest with me at £26 on the bed. At £26, I've got £110 bed. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's jumped over £100 after a flurry of <laughs> online bids. At £130, I'll take £140. Oh, one thirty. Walking stick collectors. Well, it's walking away with it, isn't it? It's running away. Didn't you know, stick this one. The gavel's up at £130. Gosh, it was nice, but no one expected that. Good find, Anita. Yes. Anita Manning. That was a good spot. <laughs> Next up, Paul's biggest purchase, and our last lot, the John Bellany print. Good luck. Very, very interesting, this one. I do have a little bit of interest with me at 120 bid at 120. Oh, we need more than that. Uh, 120, 130 bid. Oh, 130 bid to my left. 140 bid, 150 anyway. Yes, we've got oh, the internet now. Oh, 150-pound bid. Far too cheap. Oh, it's far too cheap. It's cheap and up slow. Oh, 150 bed, I'll take 160. Oh, 150 bed. On the net, 160 anyway. Oh, we all done and finished last call, then the gavel's up at 150. It did good. Not brilliant good, but good. Let's go do the figures. Come on, get out of here. Right. Now, where's me abacus? Paul has added to his piggy today. After auction house costs, he made a profit of just over £30. He can take around £364 and 80p through to the final leg. Anita is today's winner, though, making nearly four times as much profit after fees. She now has £347 in her pig and trails Paul by just £17. <laughs> Gosh! It's going to be close in the last road trip. We're going to have a blinder of a last leg. Feel that pressure, Anita. <laughs> I can't wait. Hey. Cheery bye. <laughs>